So welcome to our Asian Coaching Supervisors Network. I think that most of you have been here before. Maybe for some of you, it's the first time that you're joining. The, the goal that we have in this meeting is to bring visibility to coaching supervision worldwide, particularly this network in Asia. So we have meetings uh, that are appropriate, at, at an appropriate time for people in Asia so they can we can participate and at the same time we can learn from each other. It's open to anybody who wants to participate. So some people make an effort, like Michel Morel from Paris, who since the beginning had been part of that, wake up really early in the morning to be here at 5 a.m. for him. So thank you for being here. And then we have people who may be here before, some who are here for first time. Uh, welcome everyone. And today I am very excited about the topic we're going to be covering, that's intercultural competence, that it's so important these days. And Alex, you are going to be our presenter. And uh, I ask Alex for her to share with you whatever she wants to share. And what I want to, and she asked me, okay, what do you want to say about me? And I was just telling her that I was impressed by all of the titles she had, her PhD from Fielding and her master from Thurston University and a really, really impressive um, education. And uh, Alex, I really respect her. She was one of the graduates from our coaching supervision program and always was very committed to coaching supervision. Now she is involved in also training coaching supervisors in Korea, in South Korea. So it's great to have you here. And I don't know what else would you like people to know about you? Yeah, I am actually curious what people want to know about me. Any question? <laughs> Anybody want this? Yeah, I mean, this is really open question. I always consider myself as an accidental practitioner. You know, I didn't plan it this way, you know, obviously, you know, in 2004, you know, that, you know, that RB evolved to coaching and coaching supervisor. So, I mean, I did marketing before I studied OD interventions and I never planned the next steps in my career and it naturally just evolved to here. And so I think, you know, that uh, we probably all know each other, but I think I'd like to, you know, to quickly hear your name and where you are calling from. Do you, so want, to, do you want them to share verbally or do you want them to put it in the chat room? Oh yeah, I think, you know, that uh, given the short time that we have, mm -hmm. please put down in the chat where your, your name is obviously there in the chat box. So just let us know where you are calling from. Australia, Canada, India, Singapore, India, Mumbai, Paris. Australia, Kolkata, Malaysia, Malaysia, Shanghai. Wow, so we have actually quite a good representative of at least two, three different continents, Asia, America, and Australia. So I think you know that this is global enough. And uh, my name is Alex, I'm calling in Seoul, you know, from Seoul, Korea. And yeah, I mean, you know, that I think, you know, that let's just jump into, you know, topic of culture, because I think my love hatred relationship with culture started like, you know, over two decades ago when I was marketing director for international division of interior design firm in Korea. So that interior design, design firm catered mostly to uh, the prestigious, you know, the multinational, big, you know, multinational global companies here in Seoul. So most of my clients were, Kore you know, in most of my clients were foreigners. And as, a, as just somebody who is in charge of international division, a big part of my job was to apologize what has not delivered and what has not missed, you know, what has missed in, in terms of due date. I didn't know that uh, interior design field was so much, you know, the full of defect by default. So, you know, that I had to apologize, you know, the Japanese, you know, Americans, British, French, and, you know, Indians and Middle Easterns and, you know, so many different cultures 
And I think, you know, that at that time, I didn't really know what culture was. But I think, you know, that uh, from natural, almost animal instinct, I actually, you know, apologize the different ways to different cultures. And then later, actually, I went to a business school called the Thunderbird, which is famous for global management. And I think you know, that from there, I learned actually there's a science behind how to work with the people from different cultures in a more effective way. So there, you know, I got really interested in intercultural management. And after that, actually, I changed my career from marketing to intercultural management and then branched out to OD interventions and leadership development. And it was 2008 that I got introduced to coaching, objective coaching. And it was one, 10 years after 2018 that you know, I was really pulled in you know, by one of my friends to Damian's coaching supervision program. Yeah. And one thing actually I really learned about coaching supervision is that who you are is how you, how you supervise. So we will actually start from who we are as a cultural being. And Damian, can I share my slide? I will Damian? be the co-host too. And then let me know if you want to, at some point, go to um, rooms. We can do that too. Yeah. And actually, you know, that this is actually more nervous than I expected. I thought this would be really easy conversation. <laughs> but I think it always feels different to present, you know, that uh, to work with participants versus to work with coaches and coaches, coaching supervisors. Because I think I know there are so many experiences, expertise, and wisdom in this space. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to present that much. But what I'm, what I'm trying to you know, create here is a dialogue and also co-creation. So let me share my screen. So this is really, you know, that how we can incorporate cultural competencies when we supervise. And, you know, I'm not, you know, although this, is, this talk is about culture and cultural competence, I think, you know, that the real foundational concept behind it is development theory, because that's what we are, that's what we are focusing when we supervise. And also there are a lot of correlation between development theory, developmental stages, and also the development of cultural competencies. So, you know, that uh, I'm going to structure our dialogue around just the three questions. So, who you are as a cultural being? How does it impact you supervise? And also, the, my, my second question is, how does culture show up in, in your supervision? But I think the more importantly, I want to spend you know, more time on the question of how to use culture as a source of development in supervision. So at this point, I want to hear your cultural stories. So I think you know, that we all you know, have been through our own cultural journey and it impacted who you are. And in my case, I never was conscious of I was Korean before I went to the state. Because you know that in Korea, like it, it, you know, everybody is Korean, so we don't have to really, you know, think about, oh, you know, what am I as a Korean? But I think it was, you know, that when I get to the States for my business school, that I realized because you know that people identify me as Korean. And sometimes I have to represent myself as a Korean. And, and at the same time, you know, that living, living and studying in the States, it really impacted me to stand up and speak up more. 
And I think, you know, yes, partly from U.S. culture, but partly actually from the business school culture, because that was the first time that I, that I get exposed to American culture. And then later, you know, that when I studied intercultural management, I brought in a Dutch consulting firm's service to Korea. So I started to work with a lot of Dutchies, you know, Swedish, Finns, and a lot of Europeans. But I think what I learned from working with my Dutch colleagues is that really, you know, that how to contribute to hold the space together. Because, you know, my culture shock when I first worked with, you know, the Dutch people is that if there are, you know, that 15 people in the room and we have to make a decision, they literally ask around all 15 people. No, no matter, you know, that how many responses are overlapped, you need to listen all 15 people's response and then they make, you know, the consensual decision. So it takes a lot of listening and also it takes a lot of patience. So I think that's what I learned from Dutch culture. And later, you know, that uh, Jeff is here, you know, they're from Shanghai. I used to work at Shanghai and my interaction with Chinese people, Chinese culture, working in Shanghai really taught me how to pay forward. Because, you know, that uh, I got benefit a lot from many grace, you know, and also many generosity from Chinese people. And they don't really insist that, you know, for me to return back their generosity. It's about really, you know, that how to pay forward in a gracious way. I think that that's the really beauty of Chinese culture. So we all, you know, go through a cultural journey and we all take learning from this cultural, you know, cultural exposure or cultural experiences. So we are going to have a, you know, quick conversation about what is your cultural journey and what is your learning you took away from your cultural journey. So Damian, I need your help. Uh, I want to spend a little because this is actually really interesting and also deep story. I want to make a create a diet pair and each person will spend two and a half minutes of you know sharing your cultural journey and and as a as a as a consequence, you know, that what you know how you become as a cultural being. So two people two and a half minutes each. So I think, you know, that we have five minutes total. There are 14 people now in the room. Do you want to participate in one of the days, yes. Alex? Yes. And how long do you want to do this? Oh, totally five minutes. Five minutes. So two and a okay. half minutes each. Okay, so we'll let you know when you have a minute to, to come back. Okay. my second year at university in Europe. Um, hello, Damien. Hi, would Hi you Damien. Mind, would you mind if I record this part or would you mean to, want me to stop the recording? Um, I'm okay with it. How about yourself, Sophia? Yeah, why not? Okay. If you change okay. your mind, let me know, no problem. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so, so what I was saying, Sophia, was that, um, you know, the first time that I had a chance to leave my home country of the United States was uh, my second year at university. Mm. And I went to Europe and I studied there. So I studied in this very small place, Luxembourg, and, um, and you know, was able to visit France and Germany in a number of places. But I'll tell you the, the, the place that I really noticed the difference in where I'd been brought up and in the new culture was when I went to Hong Kong. So this was 30 years ago nearly, and I lived there for 13 years, and now I'm in Shanghai. But what I noticed was that 
I had a certain level of confidence and I attribute it to growing up in the United States where you're kind of expected to speak up. And I don't know, it's, it's something that I hadn't realized until I realized it, that maybe some of the people I met from other Asian countries or other places didn't seem to have um, the same kind of a confidence level uh, from the place they were from. That was my, that was my, how I looked at it anyway. So I grew up in the United States this is a country that has some influence in the world. And I guess I just kind of breathed that in somehow when I was mm. growing up there. And I was surprised when I didn't notice that as much in certain folks from other, some other places. Um, the other major influence on me just generally is, uh, is a Chinese culture. So um, both in Hong Kong and even more so in Shanghai and other parts of China, I noticed that people were, so I, as I'm a facilitator as well as a coach. And so very infrequently would Chinese people be the first to speak up in facilitated gatherings, right? Um, and so uh, this idea of um, not wanting to be seen as, uh, you know, as, um, you know, uh, somebody who was taking the lead, somebody who was, whose voice was more important than others by speaking up, etc. and this idea of hierarchy, these were all new to me. And so um, I, um, I found that, uh, useful as a way of broadening my way of, um, of, of thinking about and then acting differently uh, with various groups of people. So more of a we focus than a, a me focus, let's, let's say. So those are the things that came to mind when uh, Alex asked the question. Mm. Thanks for sharing, mm. Jeff. Yeah. Well, I'm Hungarian. I'm living in Australia now for eight years. As a child, I lived in Africa, in Libya for two and a half years. I have only good memories. And uh, then when I was in, after finishing high school, I went to the UK again for one and a half, two years. I was an au pair. I think that was a bit of an eye opener. And, um, and at the same time, it was, you know, like a bit secluded. Like, you know, I was working with a family. I interacted with other au pairs, everybody from a different culture. That was very interesting, but we were more friends. And then, I started working for a multinational pharma company, which was initially Swedish and then it merged with an English company. So I've got quite a lot of feedback, I think, early on that my communication is very strong or very direct, not strong, direct. And I, when we moved to Australia, this even became quite a bit of an obstacle in a way that oh. how I, you know, like... Um, that direct communication, no, I just call it no fluff. Whereas here in Australia, it's very fluffy or, you know, you have to, you know, how you are doing, like all that things, which I guess you do it in Hungarian as well, but it's just not, you just go in, in media stress in the middle, you, you just want to get things done. Yes, you appreciate people, you are not um, rude or anything, but just it's much more straight to the point. We are here for a thing. And over here in Australia, it's, you know, so I heard that I learned the hard way. So um, I'm still learning. <laughs> and I think some, I, I just did a 360 recently and this, uh, you know, just being courageous to showing up or sharing myself. And at the same time, how is it too vulnerable or too oversharing, too personal? So I'm still sort of you know, how do I give feedback in a way that's meaningful and it doesn't come across that I'm rude, which I don't mean to be rude. I just don't know how else to say it. So, yes, it's an inter interesting uh, question, I think, that Alex, uh, Alex asked. And I'm sure Damien has something to add as well. Yeah, Sophia, I'm curious about that directness, where it came from, what, what, from what culture, from everything you were exposed, you know? I think Hungarian, yeah. Hungarian, just, yeah. Well, I am Argentinian and I didn't also saw that I was Latino till I moved to the United States. Like Latino <laughs> was nothing like I could relate to. So suddenly I became Latino. But interestingly, because I was Jewish, I knew that I was different in Latin America. Because being Jewish wow. in Latin America is because they're Catholic countries. You are wow. really a minority. So for example, you cannot become a president. So I knew I was second kind citizenship citizen. Wow. I'm here in America Latino too. So forever. That's okay. I managed. <laughs> okay. We need to go back to, to the main room, but great to, to share the space with you. Thank you for sharing, folks. Yeah. So everybody's back. Alex, and we have also joining us two more people, Jaya and Naveen. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, you know, probably I think two and a half minutes are really short, too short to share all of your beautiful cultural stories. But I think, you know, that at least you have a taste. So, you know, that, um, yeah. And I had a wonderful dialogue and I got to know more, I, I got to know more about, you know, how beautiful diversity Indian cultures have and how it impacts, you know, that uh, coaching supervision. So thank you, Kaushik, for that. So, you know, that when we actually, you know, get more aware of our cultural layers inside of us, I think it's, it makes us easier to bring that layer to coaching and coaching supervision when we work from, you know, that, uh, from different cultures. But I think if we think about how culture shows up, in our supervision, in our coaching supervision, or you know, the in coaching, you know, obviously when you work with you know with somebody who's from different culture, there is cultures there. But you know, that I am also really curious: how does culture show up in your coaching supervision? So you know, that given the short time frame we have. We are now going into the you know, another breakout group, but I just want you know hear from you know from you you know the, from from you know you just shout out how does culture show up in your coaching supervision? What's your case? So. Um... This is Kaushik here, and um, I found, and I mentioned this to Alex when we were in the breakout room, the way I was working with somebody from South Africa, um, and uh, I realized that um, at one point, I was very excitedly going towards, uh, you know, converging on what we needed to work on. And uh, he says to me, Kaushik, um, don't put everything in a sausage factory. And uh, I kind of uh, took a step back and I said, oh gosh, I, I had no idea I was doing that. And I realized at that moment that um, he needed much more space to explore and space, time, attention, sort of a, and yet at the same time, a convergence, but not an absolute convergence. So um, that, that taught me. So, so the aliveness to the other person's response to you um, you know, is, is actually how, you know, it's, that, that to me is really important. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kaushik. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. So it's really hard to, hard to actually set up the, you know, the expectations. Yeah, well, in a way, you know, I am not even sure whether it's setting up the expectations in the beginning. I, I'm not sure that you know it from the beginning, even if you set up the expectations, because I'm not sure every aspect of the expectation is known at the start. I think what I'm talking about is also the fact that there needs to be an aliveness to an, to an emerging expectation or an emerging reality. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, a sort of, a, you need to allow yourself to make a mistake um, and not hold that terribly against yourself. Um, you know, and if you have to hold it terribly against yourself, then that's also fine. But um, but you learn from that. Mm. Um, so that's that's the uh, to me that's the openness to it. You, you, and, and I found a huge amount of learning coming from there, from just just seeing it from that person's point of view. But it can't be decided beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know he just touched upon very important two concept: emerge. Let it emerge, and also, you know, let's experiment it together. I think, you know, that those are the really important two keywords when we work with cultures. And any other, you know, that uh, stories that you encountered culture, you know, or in a proud way or in a sorry way in your in your coaching or coaching supervision. I'd like to hear one more story. Yes, Michelle. Did yeah. I look like I was putting my hand up? <laughs> I'm happy to speak. I think it actually dovetails on Koshik's quite well to say um, what I found is 
that I almost feel like I visually turn my hat before I go into a coaching session, mm. trying to remind myself to stay open and listen deeply and very mindfully turn that hat because of not wanting to make assumptions. And that's true with both, um, I, I work mostly in California, but that's true of people, I've got mostly clients from all around the world and different cultures. So being very mindful not to take my Indian culture and mindset or the West, uh, the English or the Californian and US based, but just to let it emerge. But I found the tool for me is deep listening and then checking assumptions before I jump to them. Yeah, I think listening always, all, you know, especially deep listening always helps. Michelle, quickly your story. Yeah, I am part of a pro bono program called the Ethical Coach. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, coaching, it's, uh, I supervise uh, people from there. And Ethiopia, it's a country where the bus leaves when it's full. And as I have been expatriated in Germany and Austria during a total of 10 years, you know, I am quite rigorous about time. Yeah. And so <clears throat> my challenge there is to really be soft with time management of people in this country. It's really, really difficult for me, you know, I have to stay <laughs> calm yeah. and serene because for me, eight o'clock is eight o'clock. Uh, but for, for my supervisee, uh, eight o'clock can be 8.30 or, or even uh, <laughs> Yeah. She, she doesn't appear. So it's, it's really, I, I have to really make big efforts to stay professional and just try to be a supervisor and nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, but thanks time, for man yeah. time management at its peak. Yeah, and it also helps you to be patient. I have, you know, I'm in the same program and I'm, I'm also working with one coach from Ethiopia and she teaches, she teaches me how to be patient. So I haven't heard from her for like almost over a week. And then I will, then, you know, that somebody told me that there is actually civil unrest going on in Ethiopia. So internet is down, totally down. Mm, so, yeah. I mean, those things probably we would never guess. And also, you know, that I sent her a contract and it took a week to get it back. So I think, you know, that uh, that's how we learn from, you know, people from different cultures as well. So I think, you know, that what I'm hearing from this group is that you are really, as an experienced coach and coach, you know, coaching supervisors, I think you are already on the advanced program because I think, you know, most uh, you know, presentation or sharing that touches upon coaching in, in our culture in coaching or coaching supervision will start from actually how we are different. So, I mean, here, I mean, people use a lot of models like Hofstede models, Trumpeners, you know, that uh, Globe Smart models, or the, I think the most, you know, recent popular ones, the Edin Myers one. But I think, you know, that these are the maps. So I think, but even in the maps, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of implications behind it. But I think when we use it in a more prescriptive way, sometimes actually it's better not to use. So I'm going to share my screen. So probably I think, you know, that this is really culture 101 these days. So I'm not going to spend much time here. I actually use the Hofstede model here as a, just, you know, the most of, you know, the popular and at the same time, most basic, you know, foundational model. So it's all about the value differences and, you know, how Hofstede collated these dimensions uh, that to his observation, to his research, what makes the biggest difference when people from different cultures work together? So these are, the, these are the five dimensions he identified. 
The first one is how people relate with power. And he called it high power distance and low power distance. But it's not about actually, you know, the, whether you are, you know, located on the high power distance or low power distance. But I think it's the impact. How does it impact you working with the different cultures? So if you are high power distance, you are more dependent on power. If you are low power distance, meaning that the distance between you and the somebody in the power is short, you love to coordinate with power figure. So that's you know that what's behind this you know the power distance. And but I think also you know, there's a lot of implication behind this because you know, I work with a lot of Western experts in Asia, and their their uh, how can I say their automatic assumption when they come to Asia is that oh this is a high power distance culture, so I have to give more directions to people. But if you actually really look at what's behind the Asian power distance there is actually a strong sense of mutual service behind it. So if you have power, you give protection to people. And if you are, you know, the you know, people who have less power, yes, you know, that you are going to get the directions. And, but you know, that as the showing loyalty or respect to the power figure, you get the protection in exchange. So sometimes actually, you know, that uh, people forget the sense of protection they have to provide, they only give directions, then it may come across as autocratic rather than you know, the benevolent part, you know, father figure, power, you know, power figure. And the second one you know, that creates actually the biggest you know, dissonance, dissonance in intercultural scene is uh, our direction of loyalty. So if we are more loyal to self, and you know the limited circle of you know ourselves like a family or the you know the short you know circles you know the close circles you know the around us we call it individualistic but if we are more loyal to the group that we belong to that's we call it collectivism but here actually what it really is important to understand the collectivistic culture is the boundary of group because people pay loyalty and people pay, you know, all the benefit of being in the group to only for those who belong to the same group. So that's the, you know, that uh, the trick behind the individualism and collectivism. And the third one is to Hofstad, it is called the masculine feminine, but to be politically correct, you know, that, you know, these days actually we change the name to achievement orientation versus quality of life orientation. So achievement orientation is something big, fast, you know, the, the bigger the better, the more the, met, the better. You know, I work with a lot of Chinese and recently I had some regional program with, you know, Asia Pacific participants. And we are supposed to introduce ourselves using three numbers that shows, that tells something about ourselves. And I actually, this is international group because there are a lot of Europeans there as well. And most people pick the numbers under 10, single digit numbers. But it always amazes me how Chinese participants pick the really big numbers. So it's not like, you know, that hundreds, they pick millions and billions. So I think, you know, this, this tells something about Chinese culture as well versus, you know, that if we come to the you know, across dimensions, you know, that according to Hofstede feminine culture, the small and slow are more beautiful. So I think if we are, you know, the familiar with the Nordic culture, you know, that uh, something called the yantelop, or I think, you know, we have some Australians here, cutting the tall puppies, that's actually really about, you know, that feminine culture. And so, and, and if we move to the next dimension, the next dimension is really interesting because it's all about how much predictability or structure we need from the system. So if we need a lot of predictability, we call it high uncertainty avoidance. You know, that he, in high, un high uncertainty avoidance culture, giving a peace of mind, a sense of security is really important. 
but you know that if we move to the, the opposite dimension, which is more about we don't you don't need much predictability structure, you can just do it. And you can you can take risk in a more easy way or you know with less burden on your psychology. I think that's more about the uncertainty avoid you know how uncertainty or predictability or structure plays in our culture. And the last dimension is add-on, but I think this is you know the when I use you know I use when I work with East to West comparison. Because when it comes to Asian culture, India is the you know same, you know, India is the same in this sense, you know, to Asian culture. Everything is in the context. So people are very pragmatic. And Mao Zedong, you know, oh no, Deng Xiaoping, you know, when he opened the Chinese market, he said the black cat, white cat, it doesn't matter as long as it catches a mouth. So this is Asian pragmatism, and it's not about right or wrong, as sometimes, you know, when you, you, know, you notice from Western leaders, but it's about whether it is proper or improper to the situations. This is actually, you know, that uh, these models are best used when you create the dialogue around culture, culture. So this is actually a cultural construct that you can use for, to promote more dialogue. And, but the more important thing is that this is one culture 101. So this is more about the creating awareness. So any questions or comment up to here? Jaya raised her hand. I don't know if Jaya, you want to say anything? You want to share or that was before? Sure. Um, first of all, apologies for joining late. Um, I wanted to bring a perspective about the divergent and uh, convergent conversation. So I supervise Asians, especially Indians, and I also supervise people outside. And I've noticed the difference in the conversations. So the conversation in Asia is more about what should I do? more on the doing piece and mm. here it's more about about the being about self about a deep reflection and initially i had a judgment around expertise and said maybe they're not expert enough to be able to talk about being but then i realized it's a cultural context it's they understand when it is more analytically broken down versus you know so so for them to get into being is it takes time for, well, especially later Later, they, they Later yeah, yeah. it takes time. It's a journey, but the conversation always starts from. So, so I understand all this. Tell me what exactly I should do. How should I go and do it? However, that that conversation doesn't come in the cultures in the West, especially US, UK. It doesn't come, and that's very interesting to notice how convergent and divergent plays out in the supervision conversations as well. So, I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, I mean, thank you for bringing that, bringing that out. And, you know, sometimes actually it makes each other, you know, frustrated. I want to talk about the big picture, why we do this and what is it really about versus, you know, that the different culture actually really just want to know how, how to do it. So I think that's another thing that we can actually take consideration into when we play with, you know, different cultures. But I think you know that these are actually first steps of you know the you know building cultural awareness or building cultural competencies, because I think you know that when you work with people from different cultures, or when the topic is you know intercultural management, this is the you know the first way to uh, bring in the you know the conversation to the supervision space or coaching space. But I think you know that especially in supervision. Our focus is that how to develop the coaching supervisor's consciousness or the being to be more, you know, that uh, to be more mature or to be more, in, you know, to, to be more inclusive or to actually to be supportive of coaching supervisors. And then I think we are moving to the creating cultural competencies. So it's not, you know, building awareness is the first block, but, you know, obviously we are moving into the, you know, the creating competencies. And when it comes to, you know, the creating competencies, the most classic one is, 
the Milton Bennett, you know, the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. So here, you know, that he has six stages of, you know, starting from denial, there is no cultural difference. Defense, oh, you know, that our culture is the best. The other cultures does not make sense at all. Funny, strange, you know, inefficient. To the minimization, oh, you know, that we, this is globalized world, you know, that, uh, you know, we, we watch the same Netflix movie, we watch the same Hollywood movie, and we all are human. Yes, I think that there is you know, a certain comfort miss, but you know, the still, this is very ethnocentric perspective to culture. And the, you know, the, the biggest actually, you know, the step forward is that you see the relativeness of all these different cultures moving into ethno relativism. So, you know, that, you know, when you accept the cultural differences, you become respected, you know, that differences, and then you adapt you know, that uh, to the situation. So, you know, that uh, this is, I think, you know, that where the most emphasis is on, especially in the management or leadership, you know, the field that, you know, when you work with the people from different cultures, how to adapt. But I think, you know, that we have to go beyond that, especially in this multicultural age, that which is actually, you know, the, not just the globalized, trans-globalized age, it's about the integration. So how we can integrate the differences into unity. So this is Milton's, you know, Milton Bennett's developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. And um, there is actually, you know, definitely, you know, that comfort in ethnocentric, ethnocentricism. Because I think, you know, that these days it's hard to confess I am ethnocentric in any sense, right? It's politically not correct. And I think, you know, that uh, we are all dealing with, you know, sophist sophisticated, you know, the, the, the professional. So nobody will confess, you know, the ethnocentricism. But, this, but there is actually really a sense of comfort in being ethnocentric. So this is actually the short poem, Gullik, from Danish writer Piet, Piet Hein. And this is really interesting. When it is 11 in Denmark, it's five in the US, 10 in London, you know, the 5 p.m. in China. How fortunate we Danes are a chosen people, lucky enough to have been born in just one little blessed land where the time is 11, when it is 11. <laughs> we are the one who makes sense. Others don't, right? <laughs> So, I mean, because I think, you know, especially in this pandemic area, like, you know, that everybody is stricken by fear and, you know, sense of uncertainties and insecurities. We need something to hold on to. So, you know, that I see a lot of, you know, regression back to the ethnocentrism these days. And sometimes it's hard to bring. But you know that I'm going to actually you know uh, show you my model of cultural competencies, which is once again you know that very developmental frame. I work with you know that uh, I stopped counting you know somewhere around you know the 50. I work with more than 50 cultures, and you know the number of leaders that I work with on the topic of into, you know the cultural competencies are uh, numerous. And from my observation. I identified the three developmental stages needed for cultural leadership. So the first stage is, you know, developing awareness. Here, culture is programming. So, you know, that, uh, that's the way, you know, when we use the model or, you know, that, uh, that's, you know, that uh, when people are trained, you know, when you go to US as an experiment, expat, you do this. When you expatriated to Japan, Japan, you know, that what's do's and don'ts. I mean, these are actually essential. And, but I think, you know, here, uh, it's, you know, that mainly the culture is given from outside as an external frame. So culture is imposed on us. But, you know, that once actually you get experienced and exposed, and when you start with more of the multicultural, you know, the foundation, and, and when you accumulate more of the cultural exposure, you learn different takeaways from different cultures. And inside of you, 
you are going to have a certain level of cultural repertoire. So when you work with the different cultures, it's not about, oh, I'm working with the French, so I should do it in a French way. Or I'm working with Koreans, so the Koreans, you know, that will probably handle this situation this way. But it's really about, you know, that what best serves in this context and what's the repertoire, what's the tool, what's the cultural tool inside of me that can match my intention in the best way. So here, the relationship of culture and individual is actually a matter of selection. So I am Korean, but when I work with, when I work French, I can increase a little bit of my Frenchness. Or you know, when I work with you know people from Latin America, Argentina, like you know the Damian, you know, I can a little bit you know they create a little bit of more polychrony or more you know that uh, dense like you know the movement in our interactions. So here. Culture is, you know, your choice, your selection, and how you can use culture is that you can actually proactively negotiate what's happening in the interaction when you work when you work from people from people from different cultures. So here, culture is in a repertoire, and how to manage culture is negotiating reality in the moment of interaction. So this is, you know, that if you are at an executive level, we want to see at least this level of, uh, you know, cultural competencies. And I think, you know, that when you are coach or when you are coaching a supervisor, working with another coach or, you know, another coaches, probably I think, you know, that uh, it's rare that you have to teach them the cultural models, but it's about, you know, what kind of repertoire, what kind of cultural repertoire are you bringing to this supervision space or coaching space? Probably that's more relevant. But we can go actually one step further, which is, the, you know, to my observation, the last stage of cultural competence. So here, culture is really to create cohesion. So here, culture works like a glue, meaning that at this level, you know, take for example, if you are you know, leading an organization, or by, even if you are just leading a team, you have to create the, the bigger context that can create all the cultural differences within. So this is, you know, that, uh, this is time when we create a new culture. So culture, the, the the product of cultural competency is creating a new culture. And here, you are more embracing of the, all the differences within the system. And I, I created this model in 2013 when I was working on my PhD dissertation. And later, actually, it, it was really recent that I found out that this matches with the developmental stage of Keegan's you know, adult development theory. So developing awareness, cultural programming, you know, corresponds to the third stage of socialized mind because it's all about outside in versus working across culture. Culture is a repertoire matches to the self-authoring stage. So you decide who you are and you actually decide your culture. But actually the last stage, creating new culture really corresponds with the last stage of Keegan's model, self-transforming mind. Because that's the time people see the interconnections between the multiple systems and they get comfortable with the paradoxes or the you know, ambiguities or ironies or complexities. So I think you know, that uh, I'm going to skip these two and So I, I'd like to hear one or two comments about the, you know, the, the, the cultural competencies model. I thought it was interesting, Alex, uh, and thank you for doing this program continuously. 
Um, I, um, one of the things I thought was interesting here was that you, in your model there, you linked um, you know, managers. Uh, it, you made the distinction between managers and executives, and then that kind of growth path and that life experience path. It just makes intuitive sense to me that perhaps the managers, depending on where they're from and what kind of life experience they've had, um, especially dealing with people from other cultures would start at that programming level. That makes intuitive sense to me. And then at the executive level, it's more, it seems far more subtle and a blending or integration as you said. So thank you for that. I hadn't, and I never would have thought about mapping it to Keegan's stuff. I'll, I'll give that some more thought too. Thank you. Yeah, that was my recent aha moment. And I think, you know, that, um, we can actually, we can, we can develop the cultural cultural competencies in the coaching supervision as well. Because if we are at the, you know, the, just the creating awareness model, it's so easy to, you know, how can I say, slip into the automatic pilot. You know, my actually cultural story in, in coaching supervision is that as a, supervi as a supervisee, what I experience is that I work with the Western supervisor and uh, the topic was that you know, the HR sponsor really revealed, you know, some critical feedback about my coach E during our stakeholder alignment. And when I actually was sharing up to that, you know, the, her response was that, have you thought about the ethics here? And I think, yes, I think, you know, that, uh, you know, the, in, the, in the best sense, I think, you know, that if we can align we the sponsor in the presence of coach E, I think that's the best and, and I agree with that. But I think you know that uh, there was instant judge, judgment piece coming in. But I think you know that when you work in Asia, especially I think the alignment with the sponsor sometimes actually happened separate because people care about the, the concept of face and there's a lot of high context, the indirect communication happening. So I think, you know, that uh, my question, my actually, you know, you know, reflection on that interaction later was that what if actually, you know, that uh, we could explore it together as a collaborative inquiry of how to do that rather than just, you know, boom, you know, that in my culture or like, you know, I think that's, you know, that coming from more of the nomadic stance that, oh, this is, this is, this is not ethical. That was actually the message that I got. So I think you know, ethics is really tricky concept, but I think, you know, the, you know once again, you know, if we overlap the multiple layers of culture within the ethics, I think you know, that can be the actually really superb you know, coaching supervision conversation if she brought in more curiosity so I think, you know, that uh, we, we can move to the, you know, that uh, culture is a repertoire, but I think more importantly, uh, what we can create together in the moment of supervision and interaction, I think that that's actually the last stage of cultural competencies. And at the same time, that's what we can do. And so this is actually my uh, dissertation piece that- Can I share something? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, because I, I was involved in the new ICF uh, core competencies and I just did a video on that. And uh, one for the first core competency is on ethical, that means developing ethical practice. And the new core competencies actually dives a bit deeper and wants or expects the coach to embrace uh, sensitivities towards the differences in the client's <clears throat> beliefs and values and actually embracing the culture. So as a coach, we need to be, uh, you know, being, expand our consciousness to embrace and be sensitive about who that person's identity is. So I gave one example where this was violated uh, this client actually was a Muslim and in that religion, they are very strict about which animals can, can come into their space. And the coach had brought her dog. 
So in the same room, the dog, the coach, and this Muslim client, and she said, my coach was not being sensitive to my religious, uh, you know, beliefs that you can't be in the in a, such a close, in a close space with a dog. I'm not saying all Muslims do not, but this specific Muslim uh, felt that it was like an insult or disrespect to her dignity and was, did not respect her. So that was like one issue. So how do we sensitize ourselves as coaches? How do we raise our level of consciousness about what is their culture? What is their belief? What is their value? And how do we make, you know, be curious enough to ask at least, you know, I'll be having my dog, is that okay with you? And she, then she will learn something new about her client. Okay, yeah. Well, Thank you, Francis. So I think that's the point of this one. So how we can use culture as a you know learning source or a developmental source, and I was going to you know that get more of the group intelligence about you know how to how to use culture as a source of development, but let me quickly share share just the two slides mm -hmm. to create the, you know how we can really create you know reflective dialogue and collaborative inquiry in you know, coaching supervision. Yeah, just, uh, Alec, we need to start wrapping up because we have three minutes left. So see if we can okay, three okay. minutes. Okay, yeah, sure. So I think actually, you know, that in a nutshell, I think that is, you know, that true to the real spirit of the coaching supervision, so I think, you know, the two things that we can do is one is about the relational competencies, like, you know, that this is actually close to the, what Felicia presented in relationship resonance. And intersubjectivity is just a fancy word for the, you know, the relational resonance that, you know, that I did, you know, that uh, research about what happens when two people from all the differences, including culture, co-create a new shared meaningful reality in the moment of coaching interaction so what you know if we are really connected yes there's a sense of connection but all the topics make you know that a congruent sense and our consciousness really gets expanded to the topic and to the world and you know that my research participants called it trinity space coach coachy and the topic gets aligned and that's the time culture moves off to the edge and you know that last box is more about the really you know that what created that space. I think this is really you know that I'm not going to go through all of them because if you are a wonderful coach, if you are a wonderful coaching supervisor, you all demonstrate it. But the second one is that as I matched with you know the developmental theory, you know what helps you know that people move from the developmental stages helps to you know that play with culture as well. So it's about the subjective objective, subject object move that what do I believe here? How can I be wrong? Jennifer, Jennifer Gabby Burgers, you know, the question. So like, you know, you have to be out of anything on, on pilot. And the second developmental move, transcend and include. Life is messy. Culture is complex. The world is complex. Take it, enjoy it, and be ready to improvise. But the most important one is cultural humility. You can never be an expert of culture. So, you know, the, our humility increases with the cultural perspective. And in that humility, we'll find the wisdom. So, thank you. That was great, Alex. Let's turn on our microphones so we can recognize Alex for a great presentation. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to learn from you. And uh, it feels like we're in a second part. It feels okay. It feels like we need to keep talking about that. Because as Francis was talking before about ICF having this new second competency about the coaching mindset. The coaching mindset first is, uh, is acknowledging not only cultural issues and systemic issues, but also supervision. Doesn't talk about supervision, but talk about reflective practice. You know, it's exactly what the supervision, like it's expected that coaches would engage in reflective practice. So this is exactly what the supervision. So even though the word is not there in the explanation of the competency, uh, it's a key element of, of the competency. So it was great having you here. Next month, we have Jaya from India, who's here with us today. Jaya, do you want to 
say hi and tell us briefly what you're going to be doing next month. Okay, sure. Thank you, Damon. So basically, um, uh, through the supervision practice, I've developed a process of how do you um, supervise when there is no topic. So an interesting process using time to think um, and saying, hey, hi, when you have a group together and say, we don't have anything to discuss today. How can you still facilitate? And I want to do an experimental process with all of you to see whether it works or not. It has worked in several other groups. So it'll be nice to experiment to see, hey, is it working? And I'll receive your feedback on that then. Okay. Thank you, Jaya, for accepting the invitation. And we have, we are always meeting the last Wednesday morning of the month in Asia, Tuesday night in uh, the United States. And uh, or at the same time, you need to register. So be sure that if you are in the mailing list and you were invited today, you have the information. But if you are not in the mailing list, you may want to let me know. I write your right now in the chat room, your email. So we include you in the mailing list and be sure that we give you the details about the next session. Um, a couple of more things going on. And what I'm going to do is um, here in this link that I'm going to put here is my newsletter where you get information of uh, different events, but also the recording from the sessions. So in my newsletter, you will always find the link for the next session and the recording from the previous session. So you, that's, that's, a, that's one place. And now we're opening a new website and then we will be able to put everything in the website. So we're asking people from different countries, representing different countries in Asia to have a section on the, on the site. So one of the people from Malaysia, from China, I know Jeff, I think you are for now the only one from China, you may wanna do that. Uh, Herman from Singapore, um, the colleagues from, um, from Australia, if you wanna do that too, you're welcome to do that too and engage you too, because we wanna be here, uh, in, we wanna integrate everybody interested. Um, so these are this, this opportunity. And by the way, this is a learning community for everyone. So everybody is invited to present. So I keep asking people, to present so if you have a topic that you would like to share just let me know and we'll put you in the schedule we meet once a month um i don't know if anybody have any announcement before we go one announcement that i have is we are starting a new supervision virtual program if you know anybody who is looking to become a supervisor in the asian region in a session that is a good time for asia so if you know anybody who have heard that is interested in that uh, you may let them know and uh, I don't know if there are any other announcements or anything going on. There is a, a Coaches Rising Conference that is finishing tomorrow. But if you sign up before the end of the day tomorrow, you may have access to all of the recordings from the conference. It's a free conference and it's an amazing resource. I don't know if anybody had the chance to participate, but the, the speakers have been amazing. Amazing presenters and about creating awareness. Um, so I highly recommend that uh, if you are interested in that, I will let I will share with you right now the link for that. So um, you may just, but you need you need to do it uh, tomorrow because tomorrow is the last day. And if you sign up by tomorrow, you may be able to access the recordings and the uh, and benefit from all of this free, amazing materials. Anybody has any, down, any announcement you want to make before we go? So in that case, it was great seeing everyone. Alex, what's a great presentation. I really appreciate that very much. I think it's so important for us to be able to be effective working interculturally. So thank you very much for your presentation. We may ask you to come back next uh, in a few months and do a second part or keep exploring and working together. And as I said, I want to invite everyone, if you are interested in presenting, please send me a note and we will engage you so we can learn from each other. That's our goal. Have a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for, for being here. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.